one. Act. Just cut the frame on the record. Shoot. Here we are, shoot. Okay, we're here with Dr. Thomas Freeman at uh, Texas Southern Wait. University, right here on the campus. Start again. All right. All right, we're here with Dr. Thomas Freeman at Texas Southern University on the campus in the Education uh, College. And uh, there's also a dedicated college on the university campus, uh, the School of Honors. Uh, which is uh, dedicated to Dr. Freeman and his uh, long journey of work uh, that he's done here at the university over the course of uh, over 60 years. He's taught here. Um, he's been the uh, debate coach for, well, Dr. Freeman, how long have you been a debate coach? I am in my 65th year. And um, so you... Uh, you came out of, um, uh, from Virginia, you told me. That's right. And um, what, uh, did you go to school there? Did you go yes, to I attended Virginia Union University in Richmond, Virginia. And did you, um, when did you move to Houston, Texas? In 1949. And you have a church. That's right, the Mount Horam Baptist Church, located at 1915 Lockwood Drive in the Fifth Ward section of Houston. And, and I've there. been there for 63 years. Wow. <laughs> they will be celebrating the 61st, fourth minister's anniversary in March. And at, uh, when you came out of uh, school in Virginia, mm -hmm. uh, what were your uh, what, what what was your education uh, uh, undergraduate degree? Uh, yes, following my studies at Virginia Union, I attended Andover Newton Theological Seminary in Newton Center, Massachusetts, whence I graduated cum laude, top man in the class. I then attended Boston University and Harvard for only one year. And then I went to what I tell students to be the greatest university in the world, the University of Chicago, from which I received a doctorate degree. Since that time, I did interinstitutional study in Africa, and I also studied at the University of Vienna in Austria. Now, I've heard other uh, educators say that the University of Chicago is the greatest university in the world also. Um, uh, a man of your stature, that's going to carry the most weight I can imagine. Um, why do you say that? At the time, it was ranked as one of the top institutions of higher learning. Hutchings introduced some new methods and that attracted the attention of, of educators all over the world. And they would come to the University of Chicago to be a part of the Hutchings experience. Is that a Jesuit university? Not that I know of. I don't think it has any religious affiliation at all. Okay. Well, Okay. And then, so when you came here um, to uh, you, uh, TSU, yes. Texas Southern, mm -hmm. did you immediately begin being a professor? I came as a professor. Okay. Um, at the time that the university, university was established, the effort was to draw from the resources all over the nation, persons with doctorate degrees to establish academic credibility for the university. And I was one of those whom they combed the, univer the uh, country for with a doctorate degree 
to come to the institution. So I came as a professor, already having had the doctorate degree. But I came as professor of philosophy. In fact, initially, I expected to remain only nine months. The reason, I was already employed in Virginia and my church would not release me. So, I was minister in absentia, living in Texas, pastoring in Virginia, and I would go back every three weeks for congregational interaction. I came to Texas Southern for an experiment. I wanted to find out how a person trained in religion and philosophy could operate on a state college campus where there was separation of church and state. At the end of nine months, I concluded that my experiment had worked. I was able to integrate into the life of the university and was accepted at all levels. So you, I, you, oh, I, I apologize, go ahead. That's all right. Uh, I taught a course in logic. And one of the assignments was to do a debate. The students in the class went to the then dean of students, Dr. Samuel Warren, and said, we have found a debate coach. And Dr. Warren called me into his office and said, Tom, I understand that you want to coach a debate. I said, oh, no, 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 I don't want to do that. I'm not going to be here long enough in order to do that. So I dismissed it. But the young men kept bombarding me, asking me to do it. And I said to them, I tell you what. If the four of you will be on the team, then I will coach the team for as long as I am here. And one of those four, Dr. James Race, became the vice president of the provost here at the university and is now retired. But those four students, Hamer King, uh, Charlie Wester, Lawrence, and uh, James Race, took the course, went through the rigor of the training, and I took them to the University of Chicago, where they won both of their debates. When I came back, Dr. Lanier and Dr. Bolton cornered me and said, Tom, you cannot leave. You have to stay. And they persuaded me to go back to Virginia to be released from my contract and come back to Texas. And I've been here ever since. Well, that's remarkable. I'm glad that you did. Um, what do you feel is, uh, what's, what, what makes you happiest in education? What makes me happy is, is the opportunity provided to not only watch the growth and development of students, but to be a part of that growth and development. Now, with Dr. Race, was he your contemporary or was he your student? He was a student. We are contemporaries and we have been on the faculty now. He was my boss at the time. He's a member of my church, a baggage treasurer in my church. But he was a 19 year old kid when I came here without a father who became attached to the father figure that I represented. And through the years, we've had a close relationship with each other.
And you mentioned another race. Was that, you said it was his brother. That's his brother. Uh, no, uh, that was Hema. I, I might have said race, but I meant Hema King. Okay. Uh, I had two brothers, Otis King and Hema okay. King. Otis was the uh, dean of the law school here, and uh, Hema was connected with the economic development office in Washington. Yes. I know there was a dynamic legacy yes. that uh, Dr. Race mm -hmm. would be connected to. He went to the University of Iowa, right? Yes, yeah, that's right. Yeah. In fact, went to the University of Iowa first as a student on the debate team. Wow. Yeah, and then later he decided that's where he wanted to do his doctorate, yes. And I guess George Washington Carver attended the University of Iowa also, didn't he? Well, I'm not familiar yeah. with, with his. So, yeah, yeah, that's so. The story I understand is that Dr. Carver walked from George to, mm -hmm. to Iowa yeah, yeah. as an undergraduate and the way he uh, supported himself one of the ways he washed people's clothes for them mm -hmm. on the way there yeah so yeah uh, so uh, being here at, being here at Texas Southern I guess you've um, what all of, of different uh, uh, courses have you taught over the years besides besides debate philosophy? well I really haven't taught debate I don't think I've had a course in debate. I've had courses in logic, and within the course of logic there has been debate. My primary teaching responsibility has been in the area of philosophy, introduction to philosophy, advanced philosophy, uh, aesthetics, philosophy of education, foundation, those kinds of courses. Most of them are general courses for students without regard to major. Do you, do you personally have a uh uh, a philosopher that you're going to... No, I I try to teach my students to be eclectic. Uh, one tends to view life in a narrow perspective if he chooses one philosopher. If he chooses several philosophers, he will have varying points of view to consider in the development of his own point of view. So I don't encourage any one uh, philosopher or philosophy. Uh, yes. If someone was to say to you, um, you know, I'd like to break into understanding philosophy, um, but I, I, I need a person to introduce me to get into it, who would you recommend? Uh, well, I don't think I'd recommend anybody, okay. but you can't you, you can't begin any better than with Socrates. Okay. Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, okay. the historic figures. Mm -hmm. But those will be. But I wouldn't say that this. I, I don't know. The, like yeah, depends on. I'll, 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 I'll depends on the person involved, what kind of experience he's had, what kind of interaction I've had with him. That's what I would suggest. Okay. And so, and so you taught logic all the way from day one till, till all the all way basically till now. Or are you, are you you're retired now, right? <laughs> I don't think I, t I, I taught courses in logic, yeah. yeah, but not logic all the way. Okay. Uh, my last course was introduction to philosophy. Yeah. Okay. And, and, so, and I am a coach of the debate team now. Coach, the title I have is Coach Emeritus. That's a title. You saw me in my office, right. and I'm working with students every day. Do you feel like there are any students that you've taught that it comes into your mind where you say you feel like your impact on their development and in turn their impact on the world. Uh, well, that, that, there's no better figure than Barbara Jordan. Okay. And Barbara Jordan was a student of mine for four years. Mm -hmm. Now I did have interaction with Martin Luther King, but it was only for one year at Morehouse College. But here at TSU for four years, I worked with Barbara from a teenager until she 
move into adulthood. What did you, what, what did you, did you teach at Morehouse for a year? One year, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. I was in the Department of Religious Studies and Martin Luther King was one of my students in that class. And I did not know that at the time. In fact, I didn't discover it until oh, 10 or 15 years later. And he brought it to my attention. My team, we were in Atlanta at dinner. And he came in along with his entourage. And I said to my students, look, there is Martin Luther King. And before dinner was over, he came up to our table, stuck out his hand and said, Dr. Freeman, you don't remember me, but I remember you. You taught me. And he went on to describe the course, and I looked at him, I said, I did. And from then on, we developed a relationship so that he knew who I was, and I knew who he was. My baby brother, Dr. Paul Freeman, at the time was the conductor of the Czechoslovakia Symphony Orchestra, and he was in Oslo at the time that Martin Luther King was there. He saw him at the airport. He said, uh, I think I'll speak to him. He said, no, he doesn't know me, so I won't bother about speaking to him. And he said, well, I may not get another chance to do this, so I'm going to speak to him. So my brother the ball stuck out his hand and said, Dr. King, you don't know. And before he could finish his sentence, Martin said, oh yes I do. You are Tom Freeman's brother. And this is when he was getting his Nobel Prize. Yes, yes. Amazing. Yes, yes. Uh, now, was your brother just, just attending the ceremony, or was he also? No, no, no. He was. Just, he just happened to have been in okay. Oslo at the time. Yeah. He didn't tell me that he attended the ceremony. He just said he met him, met him there. You yeah. see? Yes. Now, Barbara, she taught down in Atlanta, uh, Tuskegee. Right? Yes, for a while. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. did, did, did she ever teach a Spelman or anything like that? Not that I know of. She was at the University of Texas for a long time, I know that. Now you said you went to Vienna over in, uh, you went to Austria. Austria, yeah. What did you do there? I just did some work in psychology. I did some How long courses. Were you there? Just the summer, just the summer. Did you get to visit the uh, Mozart's home in Beethoven? Yeah, yes, and uh, yeah, and yeah. Do you know who Rudolf Steiner is? Rudolf Steiner? Yeah. No, I'm not familiar with him. He's an Austrian educator. Uh, He's the, the uh, founder of uh, the Waldorf School. Yeah. You mm -hmm. heard of him or not? No, no I don't know. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, now, you, you just had an anniversary at your church, right? Um, well, no, I said we're going to have the 64th anniversary in March. There was one I was invited to. I, didn't, well, I wasn't oh. able to make it. Uh, uh, only the previous. That was just not too long ago. Loretta uh, uh, Brock invited me to it. And yeah. she um, uh, told me it was going to be very dynamic. Yeah. I just wasn't able to make it. But mm -hmm. I'm from Cincinnati, Ohio. Yeah, uh, uh, But I'm here. We do, we do museum projects. Uh -huh. Yeah. And, uh, his, his dad owns uh, Southwest Museum. Yeah, services. it was a homecoming service that she was talking to you. Okay, and Dr. Freeman, yes. um, can you tell me, uh, you said that Barbara Jordan was, you would consider her to be your, um, your, your I guess. Well, her, her name yeah. is mentioned most. Okay. <laughs> When I'm encountered, uh, Baba Jordan, yeah, Baba Jordan, yeah, so. Now you recommended, to, you recommended that she didn't go to Harvard. Why? Well, no, no, that's not quite accurate. One of the reports says that she was denied admission to Harvard, which is the imaginative use of a situation which really did not exist because I took Barbara to Boston University along with Otis King 
to debate against Boston University. At the time, another brother of mine, Charles, was editor of the Law Review at Boston University. And my brother took her around Boston University. And following that experience, he said to me, Tom, that's where I want to go for my law school training. So far as I know, she never applied to Harvard. Well, the way the story goes, in, in the book by Mary Beth Rogers, yeah, which is the woman. Barbara Jordan, American Hero, she, Mary Beth says that that, uh, that Barbara wanted to go to Harvard, that she recommended that she did it because she told her, quote unquote, in the book, that no, no student of TSU ever made it at Harvard. Uh, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm indicating that that's fanciful yes. use yes, of some interpretation. Yes, I'm giving you the facts yes. that as I know them, yes, I have no knowledge of discussing Harvard with Barbara. I discuss Boston University because of her experience yes. with yes. Boston yes. University. Yes. Yes, she worked really, really hard at Boston University. Now, why she was there were you and her in contact? Yes, we were in contact. Because okay. yes. I know in the book it said that she would um, she burn a midnight oil. Well, well, most of us have to do that yeah. to achieve. Yes. You just jump up there, you know. What do you think? What it, What do you think it was that set her apart? Was it her combination of dedication and brains and desire? Uh, because I've heard that she just had the most imposing aura when you were around her. Right? It was just so powerful, just, mm -hmm. it just radiated power, you know. But now you have said it all. I need to say no more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a combination of all of those, plus her ability to convince through the strength of her voice. Right. So when you heard Barbara, you have to stop and listen. She had a way of enveloping you and bringing you into by her booming voice. That's right. Just some of the words that I've heard say, like, listen to her say the word to Tocqueville, you know. To talk, Phil. You know what I mean? Yes, so, uh, you know, just grabs you right yeah, there. That's right. Yeah. And then she gave the speech, I suppose, pretty much that sealed the fate of President Nixon uh, oh. as far as getting um, impeached. Uh, well, I wouldn't describe it quite as you okay. described it. I would say that it was a significant presentation that called the attention of the nation to a condition about which something had to be done. And when she said, I will not sit by and watch the diminution of the Constitution, she meant just that. Yeah. And those who were listening became concerned and in some instances convinced that she was accurate in her evaluation. Yeah, so, and she was she was basically a uh, what you would call a constitutional lawyer. Oh yes. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay, and then um, now her impact in Houston, she had, she had done a lot of uh, uh, activist things here, uh, mm -hmm. especially in mm -hmm. the black community that a lot of people just don't know about. Mm -hmm. um, but I know some of them had to do with, uh, with education, mm -hmm. uh, defending students, yeah, uh, mm -hmm. uh, trying to make things better off for the for yes. uh, mm -hmm. for for them, yeah. as well as uh, the changes in the curriculum mm -hmm. that they would like to implement here in Texas mm -hmm. that uh, basically degrade the ideology that civil rights was the proper thing to do. Mm -hmm. uh, plus, um, that Martin Luther King himself uh, may have been a subversive. Uh, to 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 tear down his legacy and then uh, mm -hmm. uh, to uh, to just flat out uh, 
change things um, in the curriculum um, to uh, basically give black students um, uh, the idea that they don't really uh, need any more than what they have. Mm -hmm. They don't need to, uh, uh, that basically, uh, even at its core, that maybe slavery may have even been their fault mm -hmm. just because they're black. Yeah. And I know that those things are uh, intended to be implemented in some ways mm -hmm. in the curriculum throughout Texas. But mm -hmm. I guess Barbara knew that too, right? Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. And she, um, in what ways did she fight against those things? I don't recall any specific action that she took other than participation in the court decisions and arguing before the, the, the court and then being a part of the state, state legislature in the formulation of um, statute. I don't recall any, any specific action. Well, you consider her a very good attorney, right? Very good attorney, attorney. yes. Mm -hmm. And I guess the crux, the crux of being an attorney is, would be being a great debater, right? Well, I wouldn't say that being a great debater, you are therefore a good lawyer. Okay. I would say that a good lawyer is a good debater. <laughs> and a good debater is skillful in strengthening his own argument as well as finding legitimacy in criticism of the opponent's argument by showing some inconsistencies in that argument. A good lawyer, of course, is out to win his case. And the best lawyers win their cases through factual documentation. Now there are lawyers who use tricks of the trade. But I think that Barbara was skillful enough in her intellectual prowess so that she didn't have to resort to any of the tricks of the trade so that she could defend a client on the basis of the facts. And she pretty much herself helped uh, Jimmy Carter be elected mm -hmm. to president in 1976 because she uh, campaign here in Texas for him and, oh, yes, yes. and he won Texas mm -hmm. and then pretty much that sealed the deal to mm -hmm. become president. Mm -hmm. Now did did he did he reciprocate the the favor? I am not so sure. I have read that she was disappointed because he did not appoint her as uh, he did not appoint her in any official capacity. I've read that. I did not discuss it with Bravo. She did not send to me, Tom. I'm disappointed with uh, Jimmy Carter because he didn't do that. Because the scuttle is, there's, there's two schools of scuttle that I've heard. Mm -hmm. One is that he offered her attorney general, he offered her uh, uh, ambassador position, mm -hmm. and he offered her uh, uh, HUD director. Mm -hmm. So I've heard all three of these things. Now, but it wouldn't make sense to me that he really offered her the office of attorney general because she would have took that, because she's a constitutional lawyer. Mm -hmm. So I don't believe it. But it's in the book by Mary Beth Rogers. But now you've already exposed one discrepancy in her book. Yeah, sure. So this is a discrepancy that I thought about. I just couldn't come to terms with that because yeah. it doesn't make sense to me that Barbara Jordan yeah. uh, would not be the Attorney General of the United States if Jimmy Carter offered it. I can't see her saying no. no yeah, so so he did, it, it must have been that he didn't offer it to her. Uh -huh. Yeah. You see? Yeah. So, uh, so, uh, uh, which that would have been her stature of a person. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but I could see maybe offering her HUD director. I could see her maybe even offering her an ambassador position. So it sounds to me like that what happened was mm -hmm. Jimmy Carter screwed her around. 
<laughs> what it sounds like to me. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. I could be wrong, but um, now she after she uh, she, she taught at the school at UT. University of Texas, yeah. Lyndon Baines Johnson School, and her, Lyndon, her, her and President Johnson were really good friends, right? Oh, yes, yes. In fact, he was her sponsor, really, from, I don't mean in terms of money or anything, but he sort of took her under his wing and uh, provided opportunities for her to be exposed so that because uh, she could make an impression so he he was a good friend of hers yes and he also uh, uh, saw her as a political ally as well yes mm-hmm. yeah because I've seen pictures of them where you can just see it in her both their eyes and, yes, yeah. now there's this movie that just came out called Selma Are you familiar with that movie no I'm not it just came out it's got uh, it's about uh, uh, the events that happened down in Selma with, with, with the civil rights movement, Martin mm-hmm. King, mm-hmm. stuff like that. And in this in this movie, um, they make strong, strong, strong overtones that uh, Lyndon Johnson was a, a racist. Now, I, I, I've, I've read one of the books by Robert Carroll, and I've watched all the documentaries by Robert Carroll. Mm-hmm. And it took Robert Carroll 14 years to write four books about Lyndon Johnson. Mm-hmm. And in, 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 in his book, he, I think he's objective as he could possibly be. But, uh, you know, as an example, people say, well, Johnson had to have something to do with Kennedy being killed, you know. And I think Carroll pretty much solidified the fact that that's not possible. Mm-hmm. And um, also, but I think he also solidified the fact to me in my mind mm-hmm. that Lyndon Johnson was not a racist. How do you feel about that? The fact that he took leadership in initiating uh, legislation that made for greater participation in government by blacks suggests that he was not a racist, Uh, but that he was a victim of his society and that he was thinking like his society around him thought, but who had the courage to move away from what his society thought and establish support for a new direction. For it is my conviction that all of the efforts of Martin Luther King and the Southern Christian Conference would have been not without the political and moral support of a cadre of minds like Lyndon B. Johnson who recognized the wisdom in the insistence on the part of Martin Luther King that America must be made accountable for its treatment of its minorities and a change must take place. Without that combination, it seems to me it would have been just motion. But it was more than motion because there was an agency ready to take the impact and move it in a direction that it would be solidified. But you see, if the law had not been passed, all this talk would be just talk. But the Civil Rights Act was there. And Martin Luther King and others didn't write the Civil Rights Act. The Congress of the United States did. And that would not have been possible without the kind of person that Lyndon B. Johnson was. And as a racist, he would have been hesitant to take the leadership role. Yeah, because I noticed that, from what I understand, is that him and Kennedy, uh, both Kennedy brothers and him, Mm -hmm. Kennedy's entire family, Mm -hmm. pretty much they 
fought like cats and dogs between each other. They didn't really like each other. Mm -hmm. Even when Le Johnson would be invited to uh, the candy compound for dinner, yeah, yeah sure. Um, you know, he would be like, "You sit over in the corner. Here's your food. Yeah, you know, um, shut up." You know what I mean? Yeah. But they didn't get along. Mm -hmm. However, uh, the, the first thing that Johnson did when he was uh, uh, became president, yeah. uh, he stood up in the Congress in front of all the Southern Democrats, uh, pretty much ran the country, and told them the first thing that we're going to do mm -hmm. is pass yeah. tax legislation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and he had that war. Yeah. Hell, hell. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So now when 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 Barbara uh, taught at because um, she has a huge beautiful statue over there too mm -hmm. at Texas University in you know, UT Austin um, when she taught there at his school at Lyndon Johnson School what did she teach? Um, I think she taught in the Department of Ethics, professional professional ethics. It was ethics of leadership or something. It was the field of ethical leadership. Yes. Okay. And I understand her classes were run over. In fact, they had to yeah. line up every year, right, signed for her course. But you consider her to be your just your your most thoroughly quote unquote project. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And she's a shining light for the world. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So uh, uh, we're going to pretty much close right now. All right. Uh, really I don't know whether that. there are any pictures in my office yeah. of Barbara that you may much. want to. You did? Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. All right. But we really, we really, really appreciate this yeah. opportunity to talk to you. To me, oh. I feel like I'm talking to Barbara. <laughs> so, you know, that's yeah. what you are for me, a hero. Yeah. Very, very excited, very grateful. There's one thing, this is just an aside. Um, my brother Paul is a, a symphonic conductor, and he's had Barbara uh, narrate uh, one of his numbers, and I've been there and I've introduced Barbara. And Barbara said at the last time, she even said this publicly, that one thing that she liked about performing for Paul is that he had Tom to introduce me. And she said, I always like for him to introduce me because he makes me feel as though I'm somebody. <laughs> yeah. And she, she's a really great singer, too. Wasn't she? Yeah, yeah. She, she said, and so it's sisters, yes. Yeah. 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 Was, was she artistic in any other ways besides singing? Uh, not that I know, know of. She was a good whist player. Uh, she would play, okay. with the, play with the boys. Statement that Barbara made. At the, we used to have uh, a tournament named after Barbara. At that tournament, she said that one of the things that she would never forgive me for, and that is because she cannot eradicate a pattern of speech which I imposed on her. Uh, really? And she said that she would recommend to Jimmy Carter that he would spend three weeks with Tom Freeman. And if, that, he did, if he did, he would not be the same ever again. <laughs> is, that, is that what you're saying? Kind of the way you talk with the cadence and the inflection? Well, whatever, whatever it is. Well, yeah. When I was sure. when I, at the funeral okay. of Barbara, as I was going out, a lady shook my hand and she said, You something to sound like Barbara! Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's true. Wow. You know, it yeah. would have dawned on me later. But now it's dawned on me now, you know? Wow. Yeah. Uh, 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 that's amazing. So, did you, now when she started to win in debating mm -hmm. in school, with the, and you said in her senior year she was certainly, certainly. Uh, oh, yeah, she had to buy it. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, but did, but did, did she start to win some in her sophomore year, in her junior year? Well, I, I don't remember in detail, but I'm sure she did. But 
<laughs> but I'm talking at the when she be the growth and development was progressive. Yeah. So and it's not necessarily measured by winning. Uh, it is also measured by the development of her style and her competence. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And she was in the Delta Sigma Theta fraternity here on the campus mm -hmm. at, uh, at, at TSU. It's had a lot of very, very prominent women mm -hmm. come out of that fraternity. Can you remember any others? So I know Shirley Chisholm was in there. And, mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't, don't remember in yeah. terms of reaching out to the sorority. They were there. Yeah, but um, no, no special impression. I know that there was competition between the two because she lost. Two debaters ran for uh, student government, and she lost to a debater by just three, three or four votes. George Turner uh, became president at the time that Barbara was running for president, but she never became president of the student council. Yeah. So now, so at the, so at the. Um when she got when she got out of school here, and when she went to Boston College, she did well there. And so when she got out of Boston College, she came back home to Houston to yes. practice law, right? Mm, that's right. Well, along with along, yes, along with her debate partner Otis King. Okay. It was her department, her partner. In, on, in school, then partner in life. Yeah. And then she ran for pol political office, lost the first two, three times, and still ran again and won. Yeah, so an so, example of persistence. Now, yeah. now, her first political office, was, I guess, would, would, you, would that be considered a political office that she technically worked for the judge, the judge? No, that, the, I'm okay. thinking about elect, elected okay. office. All right. Uh, and that would uh, have been to the state legislature? State legislature, state legislature yeah. Mm -hmm. And she served there for a short period of time. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Then she went to uh, she went on to Washington. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Served on several committees in Congress. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and stuff like that. Do you feel like that? Do you feel like knowing her? Do you feel like her tenure in Congress? Uh, first of all, here in Texas. Do you feel like the impact that she made? You know how some people they go through and they. They do the things they do, but they don't feel like it was enough. I mean, you know, do you feel like that she, one, gave it her all, which I know she did, but did you, do you think that she felt like it was enough to change things down the road? I don't think that she projected anything around, around the road or down the road. I think she felt that she had fulfilled her mission. Okay. That's what I'm saying. Uh, and uh, that um, especially since there were limitations on her health that she could move in another direction. And we never know how severe that limitation was because uh, she almost lost her life once. You mean before she died of the yes, the yeah, yes, 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 right, because oh, she had almost died before. Yes, there was word out that she had been drowned. She had drowned, but she had uh, she just had an accident in the water, and uh, and, was, uh, and I think at the time she was undergoing treatment of some kind, and uh, this was a part of the treatment. Uh, I know a lot of times if you look behind the scenes, the people that are incredibly dynamic, especially in public life, musicians, uh, actors, and everything like that, that are really impactful in a cathartic way on society and people, yeah. you'll find that they have some uh, chronic ailment. And many of them do, and yeah. they, they don't reveal it yeah. to the public, as and you I, find it at the last moment. That, uh, and I read bro, that the reason that that is is because, on a spiritual sense, that, uh, that, that, that ailment causes them to realize their mortality, that mm -hmm. it causes them to always realize they might not have enough time. time to get done with yeah. them, yes. So they, uh -huh. and so they, uh, they, they, uh, they don't waste any time. Yes, that's a part of it. Because uh, uh, 
because Kennedy was that way. I understand uh, lots of people were, were that way. That I uh, read that it that it it, 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 it per force raises their level of vibration. Yeah. So, uh, so I didn't know that about her. I knew I knew about her at the end. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, now when she went to uh, the U.S. Congress. And do you feel like there was anything that was most poignant to her that she did, uh, whether it was working with, um, you know, the, the the committees to for immigration, or whether it was working on a special committee? Was there anything that she liked the most in, in U.S. Congress? Anything she liked doing the most? I'm I'm unable to answer okay. you. I can't do that. Uh, All right. Um, and well. Uh, is there, was there, is there, if, if there was something that you wanted to say about Barbara to somebody, do you feel like we've said it here? Do you feel like there's anything else you'd like to say about her? Mm -hmm. No more than that it was a privilege to know Barbara and a unique privilege is to have the opportunity of working with her sharing experiences, and then making a contribution to her growth and development. So you feel like she's definitely the kind of person that after she was here and gone, there's been plenty of people in the United States, the world, community, uh, that have looked at her and her example and have probably excelled just because of that. Yes. You agree? Yeah, I guess. Yeah. She has been an inspiration to many. Yeah. Yes. I would agree with that. Mm -hmm. does, does she ever do any preaching herself? Not that I know of. No. And somebody might have called it preaching. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. Uh, All right. All right. Well, Doc, we're going to stop now. Uh -huh. Okay. And we're just going to take uh -huh. some snapshots and. You know, and we really, really appreciate you letting us. Uh, and also, I want to ask you a favor.